Yeah, you can start. Okay, I'm happy to welcome Dr. Akash Kumar uh, for the seminar. Uh, um, Akash uh, did his master's from Georgia Tech, his PhD at Purdue, and is currently a postdoc at EPFN, uh, where he is currently. And um, he'll be talking to us about spectral methods in graph algorithms. Um, please go ahead, Akash. So thanks a lot for the introduction, Uma. So as Uma mentioned, today I'd be telling you about spectral methods and the success these methods have enjoyed in modern graph algorithms. Okay. So uh, let me first begin by like uh, thanking my teachers, my Amazon teachers. So uh, Sogata Basu, he was my advisor at Purdue. I learned uh, like uh, a lot of linear algebra from him and uh, some conceptuality parts of linear algebra, whatever I know, it's thanks to him. Then uh, Petros, he taught me how to use these uh, like conceptually deep ideas to uh, like get some algorithmic mileage from them. And finally, I must thank Shashadri uh, for uh, like helping me understand how to use these algorithmic tools, uh, these linear algebra tools to attack combinatorial problems. Okay. So with that out of the way, uh, like uh, let me tell you that I think of myself as a spectral graph theory salesperson and as, as a spectral graph theory salesperson, here is my sales pitch. So I think of spectral methods as uh, like really the one ring from the Lord of the Rings book. And the reason for that is spectral methods are just so versatile. I mean, they enable you to attack such a wide variety of computational tasks that there is uh, no other analogy that fits better in my opinion. So for example, like uh, if you look at uh, the classical tasks such as image segmentation, I mean, spectral methods are uh, like the go-to weapon of your choice for these tasks. So you think of an image as a bunch of pixels and you want to classify a bunch of adjacent pixels into one coherent object. So for example, over here, spectral methods can be uh, very used and they successfully were able to identify this object over here as a stationary car, this object over here as a stationary road, and remarkably this object over here as a moving car. Or in particular, they were able to identify that these objects, they're really different. Okay, then uh, also you have uh, like, uh, thanks to spectral methods, you have stuff like the page rank algorithm, I mean, the, like stuff that powers Google, right? So stuff that you use every day. So yeah, I mean, uh, like this does not need uh, much elaboration. Then uh, another uh, place where spectral methods found use uh, was uh, like they were enablers of uh, like the big data applications, lots of big data applications with connections to like things like PC or dimension reduction. This is uh, like not such a big stretch of imagination that yeah, if uh, like you enable such fundamental tools, such fundamental primitives, indeed like these applications, they would find use like almost everywhere. They would be ubiquitous, okay? Then one more cool application that I want to highlight is the application uh, that is uh, where spectral methods are used for like graph drawing, like visualization tasks. So for example, if I give you a planar graph that is very well connected, a three connected planar graph, let's say, turns out that you can obtain a rather clean rendering of such a planar graph uh, on, the two on the two dimensional plane by using spectral methods. So what you do here is that you look at the last two eigenvectors of the Laplacian and with the ith vertex, you attach uh, like uh, the uh, xi and yi, the corresponding entry from the last two eigenvectors, and you just plot it out on the two-dimensional plane, and you get a clean rendering. Like, namely, you get a planar rendering of a planar graph of a three-connected planar graph. If you want to read up more on this, you can Google tet embedding. Okay, so you would have some fun. Okay, so like uh, this is the theory crowd, and I'm also a theoretical computer scientist. So. It's uh, somehow uh, like rather remarkable to me that spectral methods, they continue to have a rather impressive CV, even for theoretical applications. So for example, uh, like spectral methods are your go-to weapon of choice if you were to think about graph partitioning problems. So given a graph, which has a subset of vertices that induces a good community, well-connected inside and loosely connected outside, so to speak intuitively, like you can recover this community or a good approximation to this community by throwing spectral methods at the problem, okay? stuff like Cheeger and Fiedler vector rounding, I mean, whatever, uh, like, you know, all this. Then uh, there is also these subgraph recovery problems. So here the idea is the following. You are given a random graph. So think of random graph as uh, like uh, being some kind of ambient noise. So it's G and one half, like the dish linear random graph. Each edge is there with probability one half. It's not there with probability one half, independently of the other edges, okay? So what I do is that inside this random graph, I plant a signal, like a big enough subgraph let's say clique of some large enough size. And now we are uh, like asking this uh, like uh, question where you want to recover a signal sitting inside some ambient noise. 
So can you do this? Right. This is the classical question that has been answered in uh, like lots of different signal processing settings. Turns out that you can also answer this in this combinatorial settings. The techniques do carry over, and uh, again, spectral methods allow you to recover uh, like some large enough planted clique. Okay. Then uh, also, spectral methods find applications for graph sparsification problems. Okay. Somebody has a question. Uh, please go on. I see a raised hand. I don't see a raised hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it just... might have been by mistake or something. Okay. okay. Then, uh, so uh, like uh, uh, spectral methods, they also found applications in graph sparsification problems. So, I mean, this is also classical stuff that I like uh, give you some graph and uh, like uh, what I want you to do is I want you to preserve all cuts or uh, like spectral sparsifiers. Then like, I mean, this led to like fundamental developments like the Cadizan Singer breakthrough and also like it led to fast Laplacian solvers, okay? So for graph sparsification tasks, also spectral methods are your go-to weapon of choice. Then also they find usages in uh, PCPs and hardness approximation and they find usages in uh, like many more places, for example, approximate counting, sampling, you name it, okay? In my research so far, I have focused on the first two bullets above. And in this talk, I'll tell you how spectral methods like played a prominent role in a graph partitioning problem for planar problems or planar graph problems. Okay, so that's the setup uh, or focus of the talk today. Okay, so now I will tell you a little bit more about the cast of characters relevant for today's discussion. And uh, like uh, in order to set that cast, first uh, let's uh, uh, make sure that we are all on the same page. So let me tell you what planar graphs are. So a graph is planar if you can draw it in the two-dimensional plane without any of its edges running into the other, okay? So for example, the graph pictured over here, the complete graph on four vertices, I claim is a planar graph. It's just that I have drawn it badly. You can fix this drawing like so. So this confirms that this graph is indeed planar. So indeed, uh, like you can intuitively imagine that if you take a graph on like lots of vertices and you throw in lots and lots of edges, perhaps you are persuading uh, like edges to hit each other and uh, the graph will be non-planar. That's intuition is absolutely spot on. And like uh, you get uh, non-planar graphs uh, on like graphs that are not very large. So for example, the two graphs pictured over here, the complete graph on five vertices on the left and the complete bipartite graph with three vertices on each side, they are non-planar, okay? And uh, you might be wondering at this stage that, hey, like is there a characterization of planar graphs? Is there a theorem that tells me that uh, like uh, an FN only theorem that characterizes when a graph is planar? So it turns out that Kurotowski and Wagner already answered this question back in 1930s. And their answer like said something like the following, that if your graph contains for some appropriate notion of containment, if it contains the two graphs contained on these slides, then your graph cannot conceivably be planar, okay? This notion of containment has a name. It goes by the name of graph minors, okay? So let's just see quickly what this notion is. You don't need to like uh, really remember what graph minors are if you've not seen it before, but uh, like the definition is not very bad. So let's just see it very quickly. So what are graph minors? So I say that a graph H is a minor of a graph G. If you can obtain a copy of H by messing around with the graph G. And how do you mess around with the graph G? So you're allowed to contract edges of G. So you take uh, an edge and you collapse its endpoints into a big single mega vertex. And you're allowed to delete edges of the graph G. Okay, so if there is a sequence of contractions and deletions that produces a copy of H at the end, I will say that the graph G contains the graph H as a minor. As I said, it's a notion of containment, right? Let's just make sure that uh, like we understand what this notion is through an example. So I claim that the graph on the right over here contains a copy of uh, like complete graph on five vertices as a minor. So how could you verify this? So notice, that if you were to shrink these five red islands into one single mega vertex, you will have vertex just join paths shown in blue here, running between every pair of islands. Okay, there are five islands and vertex just join paths running in blue between every pair. So that confirms that, uh, like indeed, the graph on the right contains a K5 minor. Okay, if this is your first time looking at the definition of graph minors, you might be wondering that, hey, what is this notion good for? Why should I care about this notion? So that's a great question. And uh, like, uh, here is a joke answer. So in a series of 23 papers, Robertson and Seymour proved what is called the graph minor theorem 
And uh, like this theorem eliminated a lot of landscape and structural graph theory, which also had a lot of algorithmic power. Okay. So in particular, uh, like using the theory of uh, Robertson and Seymour, you can answer a wide variety of questions about uh, electric loads of graph properties. So let's quickly see like these applications a bit more seriously. So you should care about graph minus because it helps you answer truck loads of interesting questions. For example, questions about embeddability. Hey, can I embed my graph in the two-dimensional plane without its edges hitting each other? That's the question that Kurotowski and Wagner already answered. You can answer, uh, ask this question about more exotic surfaces like this coffee cup. Okay, and you can ask if a graph can be embedded, can be drawn on this coffee cup without its edges hitting each other. Okay. Then, uh, like, turns out that a lot of interesting graph properties end up being minor closed. So remember, the notion of uh, graph minors is like this: some notion of containment, right? So, for example, consider the property for graph being a cyclic. If your graph is a cyclic, I'm telling you that, uh, like, whatever it contains, or all of its minors, they're also a cyclic, right? So this happens for a truckload of interesting graph properties. Okay. And then finally, like the notion of graph minus has got like some uh, very intimate connections with coloring problems and uh, the entire area of fixed parameter tractability, thanks to this notion of tree width and whatnot. So yeah, graph minus, they indeed are uh, like important and here to stay. So now I'm going to assume that like uh, all of us care about graph minus and uh, I'll move on to the first part of the talk. So now I want to like uh, get inside the first part and uh, like the first part is uh, concerns the following questions. So I would like to find minors and graphs that are sufficiently not planar. Okay. So let's try to see what this notion sufficiently far means. Yes, let's try to make sense of this question. Akash, a quick question for you uh, as an outsider. So, you know, to me, uh, I think planar graphs would have just been graphs which I write on the plane, which observe the geometry of the plane, you know, the edges kind of follow, but to allowing crisscross to for me would have been okay. So, is there a uh, you know is there another notion where crisscrossing of edges is allowed and you still get a good theory of uh, planar graphs, or is it fundamental that you have to kind of rule this out? I mean, uh, like you get uh, this uh, like rich connection. So, Kurotowski's theorem is a deep theorem because like it uh, relates to different areas, topology and combinatorics. And uh, like uh, that connection really requires you to have no crossings. But if you want uh, to like allow some crossings, then there is this notion of crossing number like that I'm not uh, like that familiar with where uh, like you can uh, like work with graphs where few crossings are allowed. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was just wondering if you don't care about crossing and still get a good theory, but uh... there, there is some work on this, but uh, like I'm not uh, like very familiar with that. Yeah, yeah just an outsider's question. Okay. Yes. Right. So, uh, like in the first part of the talk, we'll be interested in the following question. So, I'd be interested in trying to find minors in graphs that are sufficiently not planar. So, let's try to like uh, formalize this question. So, we formalize this using the language of property testing. So, for me, like all graphs that I consider in today's talk, they're going to be bounded degree graphs. Let's say maximum degree at most five or some number d, absolute constant d. Okay. So, over here in this picture, I have this big white rectangle that contains all graphs with maximum degree D. Okay, it contains all bounded degree graphs. Okay. Now this universe contains an interesting subset, this egg yolk, the yellow part of the egg. And this yellow part of the egg contains all planar graphs, all planar graphs of bounded degree, maximum degree D. Okay. Then there is stuff outside of this egg white, the egg white has thickness epsilon. So there are graphs coming from outside egg white and these graphs, stuff outside egg white, they are blatantly not planar. Okay, you must change an epsilon fraction of edges in, in, in these graphs to obtain a planar graph. You must kill or delete an epsilon fraction of edges to recover a planar graph. So like uh, this is how like we formalize the notion of a graph being sufficiently not planar. Let's see this in a little bit, little bit more detail. So first let me tell you how is the graph given to you. So it's a bounded degree graph. I give you access to a distance list of this graph. So you can ask, uh, uh, you can ask for a random vertex that, hey, give me vertex number i, I will give you vertex number i. And you can ask for the fifth number of vertex number i, I will give you the fifth number of vertex number i. Okay, so this is the kind of queries I will support. So essentially, as you can notice, that these queries allow you to explore the graph locally by crawling along the edges of this graph. So for example, you can perform a bunch of breadth first searches and depth first searches from a bunch of randomly chosen vertices. Maybe you can perform random walks. Okay. So you can explore the graph locally by crawling along its edges. Now comes to an important definition. 
So I defined that notion of distance between a pair of graphs. Okay, so I equip uh, like the universe of all these bounded degree graphs with a metric. So the distance between a pair of bounded degree graphs, G and G prime, it's just going to be the fractional symmetric difference between their adjacencies. So it's just the edge set of G, symmetric difference with edge set of G prime, divided by n times the degree bound. Okay, divided by n times t. Okay. So the question is that, uh, like, given a graph, is it here inside the yellow part of the egg, or is it here outside the egg white? Must you delete an absolute fraction of edges to get a planar graph? Any questions about the notion of distance? Okay. So you only need to remove edges. So you only need to remove edges. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. So now I ask two different questions. So the first question is the one-sided variant. So here I insist that you always accept a planar graph. If the graph comes from the yellow part of the egg, I want you to always accept it. If the graph is outside the egg white, I want you to reject it with good probability. Probability at least two thirds, some constant bounded away from one half. Okay. So notice, since I insist that you always accept a planar graph, whenever you reject a graph, you better have a certificate of rejection in your hand, right? Whenever you reject, you better know that, hey, this is the reason I'm rejecting. Here is a certificate that this graph cannot conceivably be planar, all right? So now let me tell you the two-sided variant. The two-sided variant says that uh, you're allowed, so I relax the problem a little bit. I say that, hey, you're allowed to accept graphs which are planar with probability at least two thirds. You no longer need to always accept those graphs. Okay? And the rejection criteria remains the same. Stuff outside egg white must be rejected with probability at least two thirds. Any questions about the one-sided or the two-sided variant? When you're measuring the, uh, when you're measuring uh, this uh, uh, D, uh, so it's a bounded degree graph. So the total number of edges is not n squared. So, so, so the scaling matters or not? So the, the scaling matters in the sense that uh, like I normalize in the distance by n times the degree bound, by n times t. So the distance between a pair of graphs g and g prime is the symmetric difference between their edge sets divided by nd. Right? I hope that answers your question. Uh, like, uh, let me know if you are... Uh, yes, like yes, yes, yes. It answers, sorry. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. Uh, I have okay. a question. Yes. Uh, so, so you said that uh, in this definition of one-sided uh, testing, so uh, we want to, so if you accept a graph with probability one, we want to have some certificate. Like, is that, is, is it like any algorithm that accepts uh, with this requirement can be rigged to make sure it gives us a certificate or is it just a requirement, extra requirement that they're asking? Uh, it's not an extra requirement. So for example, if you have a two-sided tester, not all two-sided testers can be converted to a one-sided testers. So not all uh, algorithms that solve problem two can be used to solve problem one. I do not know if that is the question you were going for. Is that, is that what you're There was a slight uh, misconception. Right? So you're looking, I mean, this one-sided testers only give you a certificate when you're rejecting, not yes. when you're accepting. Yes, 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 absolutely. absolutely. I see, I see. Uh, so, yes. Okay, so I'm saying can all do all one-sided algorithms necessarily give you certificates in their rejection? When they reject, yes. When they reject, all one-sided algorithms better have a certificate of rejection in their hand. Right? Nice. Okay. Great. So, Akash, one, one last thing. So, here, I guess, I guess you'll mention it soon or something. I mean, you're interested in the number of queries you make to the adjacency list. Is that the I'm, measure? I'm interested in both. The query, number of queries, and also the running time. So I was just showing running. that we, yeah. So the, we bound the running time and it uh, like automatically implies the bound on queries. I see. So I mean, maybe just to follow up on what Varun was mentioning. So I guess because you sort of want to, the queries are going to tell you when you can be sure that you are not in a yes instance. I mean, at some point you'll be you'll be convinced that you now have to answer no. So in some sense, that's the certainty. So in some sense, like uh, the, what will happen is that I will find for you, if the graph is sufficiently far from being planar, I will find for you with good probability a minor hiding inside that graph. I will discover a minor. I will discover a K5 minor or a K33 minor. I will make routine queries. And if I made routine queries, I saw no K5 or K33 minor, I will say that, you know what? This graph looks planar. Okay. okay. 
Okay. I, I, I guess my curiosity was if it was possible for such an algorithm to be some kind of a zero knowledge algorithm where you are convinced with these probabilities that it's like this one sided thing holds, yet you have no idea why the graph is not. Yeah. Right. I mean, but, I'm not yeah. sure like, if I can, uh, like, uh, uh, if the, uh, there is some kind of zero knowledge that I can incorporate here, I would uh, guess not. But, uh, like, I'm not sure about that. Okay. So, uh, okay, so I'll move on. I hope that the problem statements are clear. So with that out of the way, I can tell you a bit of uh, like history on this problem. So in terms of previous works, what was known? So back in 2008, Benjamin Iskram and Shapira presented an algorithm that uh, like solves the two-sided variant within running time, triply exponential in the degree over epsilon. Okay, no dependence on n. So this was uh, like remarkable, but uh, as you can see, the dependence on epsilon was like triply exponential. They already conjectured in that paper that this problem can be solved with a running time which grows only polynomially in the degree over epsilon. Okay. So their result was improved by Hasadem, Kellner, Newend, and Onak in 2010, who presented algorithms which ran in time singly exponential in the degree over epsilon. And finally, Levy and Ron refined their techniques in 2015 to present algorithms that run in time quasi-polynomial in 1 over epsilon. Okay. On the other hand, for the one-sided variant, the state of the knowledge was the following, that uh, back in 2014, Shumai, Goldreich, Ron, Shashadri, Shapira, and uh, Scholler, so there should be one more S over here, they presented uh, like uh, algorithms that run, that run in time root n, and they could find cycle minors, cycle minors of fixed size r. Okay, So a fixed r, r is like the part of the input. Fix some R is constant, and they could like test whether your uh, graph does not contain cycle minors, or is cycle minor free, or it's epsilon far from being cycle minor free. Okay. And then uh, Fichtenberger, Levy, Vasudev, and Wachtel in 2017 presented algorithms that run in time into the two thirds, and they could find bipartite minors with two vertices on the left, complete bipartite minors with two vertices on the left, and uh, like some fixed number of vertices on the right. So, this is what was known for the one sided variant. In the one-sided land, also a lower bound of root n was known thanks to this previous work. Okay. So what I did in joint work with uh, like Shashadrin and Stolman is that uh, we resolved both of these problems. So uh, Benjamin Scrum Shapiro also conjectured that uh, the one-sided variant could be solved in roughly root n times polylog time. So we resolved the first conjecture completely and uh, the conjecture on two-sided land completely. For the one-sided land, uh, like we gave algorithms that run in time, root in time, some little slack, and do the little over one slack. So let's see our theorems in uh, like more detail formally. So in the hey, Akash, uh, in the one-sided case, are you hiding dependence on epsilon? Or I'm hiding I... dependence on epsilon. You're okay. right. Yes. Okay. I'll continue hiding it. I will not reveal it. Okay. okay. So uh, let me show you the theorem for the one-sided land. So it's the following. It says the following: that there is essentially an algorithm that does the job. So there is an algorithm which on input a bounded degree graph, which is sufficiently not planar. What it does is that it runs in this uh, running time. It runs in this uh, roughly root in time. And it outputs for you a K5 or a K33 minor hiding inside this graph with good probability. Okay, And I'm hiding into the little over one terms. Okay. Any questions about the statement of the main theorem? So uh, how many points would you be querying in the adjacency list? Uh, yeah. So I mean, is it significantly smaller than d root n? Or? Yeah, yeah. The number of uh, vertices that you will end up querying will be roughly d root n. It will be okay. like uh, of the same order. It will be of the same order. Yeah. Okay. Now let me tell you our theorem about the two-sided land. So in the two-sided land, we show the following. Again, like the same statement. There is an algorithm that does the job. So there is an algorithm which on input a bounded degree graph, what it does, is that it runs in time polynomial in one or epsilon and it outputs the correct verdict. Whether your graph is planar, whether your graph is far from being planar, it returns the correct verdict with good probability. Okay. And now, uh, like any questions about uh, the two sided variant? Actually, what is the polynomial? What do we? Uh, so, I mean, uh, like, uh, we do not. Uh, I mean, we find the degree explicitly, but uh, like the degree is kind of large. It's definitely not uh, like we did not try to optimize it. Okay. Okay. So now uh, I'd like to tell you that uh, 
from the get go like i mean you might be wondering that hey how do you attack such questions so it turns out that interestingly there is an entire recipe to attack such questions a very good rule of thumb which was formulated by goldreich and ron and i think that uh, like this recipe is uh, much more important than any of our results so first let me tell you about this recipe this black box recipe that lets you attack property testing questions for bounded degree graphs so let's see what this recipe is okay. so in order to like tell you what this recipe is i need to first revisit the notion of expanders i need to tell you what expander graphs are so in the rest of this talk i'm going to assume that my graphs are in fact deregular it's a bounded degree graph if it's not deregular already just add enough loops okay so we'll work with deregular graphs from now on and what are expanders so expanders it's just a notion of connectivity okay so it kind of tells you that uh, like uh, hey these deregular graphs they are very well connected so an expander graph is a deregular graph that is very well connected so you might uh, be objecting to this right now that hey i mean i have a three regular graph it's not very difficult to disconnect it i take a vertex i delete all the three edges incident on that vertex so what am i talking about right so the idea is that uh, like i uh, measure the effort uh, that uh, you took in order to disconnect the smaller side from the bigger side so i will look at the fraction of the edges that you deleted uh, as compared to the total number of edges incident on the smaller side so for example if the set s is the smaller side it's a deregular de deregular graph the number of edges incident on s is d times the size of s and i look at the ratio the number of edges leaving s divided by the number of edges incident on s so the numerator is the number of edges that you must delete to disconnect the graph okay so a graph is called an expander if uh, like no matter which small set you take no matter which set of size at most n over 2 you take you have to delete lot of edges at least an alpha fraction of edges to disconnect the graph from uh, the rest okay so such a graph is called an alpha expander so for now think of alpha as being a constant okay so uh, with alpha being a constant now let me like quickly tell you like one uh, fun fact about expander graphs so a useful fact is that uh, like random walks on expanders they mix quickly so let's first see what this random graph random walk process is so like you're standing at a red vertex what you do is that you choose a random neighbor and you go there okay and uh, like you keep on doing this so that's all there is to a random walk and when i say random walk mixes quickly what i mean is that the end point of this walk end point of walk after a certain number of steps is almost a uniformly random vertex so for example take the complete graph okay it's very well connected and uh, like start a walk at vertex 1 and take a random neighbor immediately in the next step you are almost at the uniform distribution right so in expander it's a similar phenomenon happens but uh, like of course you don't walk uh, for one step you walk for log n steps okay so in expander graphs what happens is that uh, uh, if you denote by d the distribution of the uh, distribution over the endpoints after performing a log n length walk the endpoint will be roughly a uniformly random vertex and uh, so this distribution is indeed uh, like honest to goodness uh, like close to uniform distribution in l1 and you can verify that the two norm squared of such distributions will be very close to 1 over n and it cannot uh, like shrink to like a value any smaller than 1 over n i mean that's a simple proof follows by just by cauchy schwarz okay so with this fun fact in our hand now i'm ready to tell you the gold record on recipe to attack property testing questions on bounded degree graphs okay so here is what the recipe tells you so according to this recipe you should uh, first focus your attention on expanders so you should try to attack the problem in the following manner that uh, hey i am given a yes instance and i assume that this instance expands i am given a far instance and i assume the far instance expands and i want to develop a tester for this regime okay having done this ritual what you can do now is that you can exploit some of the shelf expander decompositions uh, which looks something like this that you can break your graph into a bunch of expanding pieces so all of these red pieces they induce expanders possibly like expansion is may, maybe merely one over polylog or something but uh, like these pieces nevertheless they expand uh, their expansion is small but nevertheless they expand and they are kind of loosely connected the total number of edges running between these pieces is merely an epsilon fraction so what goldreich and ronner telling you is the following that if you have a black belt in uh, testing your property restricted to expanders what you can do is that you can exploit this uh, expanded decomposition in the following manner so you will pick a random vertex it falls inside one of these expanding pieces say it falls inside this piece if you could pretend that this piece is sufficiently isolated from uh, the rest of the pieces so if you pretend that there are no white edges incident on this piece 
when you can use uh, your expertise in uh, like testing uh, this property on expanders to test the property on general graphs as well. So that's the golden egg recipe. Okay, so we know what the recipe is. We know what our problem is. Let's try to like just solve the problem. We have a hammer and we have a nail. Let's get to work. So what happens is uh, that uh, like you will see that this hammer does not quite work. So here is uh, like a brief sketch why. So like let's try to find K3 miners hiding inside uh, an expander graph. Okay, so K3 miners hiding inside expander, you will see that while this can be done, this does not generalize so well. So let's see what you can do to find K3 minus and expanders. So you start with three different terminals, the white terminal, the black terminal, the green terminal. You perform logarithmic length walks, root in many of them from all of these sources. So you perform root in white walks of logarithmic length, root in black walks of logarithmic length, and root in green walks of logarithmic length, okay? Since the graph is an expander, the length of your walk is logarithmic. The endpoint of these walks is a uniformly random vertex. So you have root and random white endpoints, root and random green endpoints, and root and random black endpoints. By multi paradox with constant probability, you see that you will be able to find a white to black path, a white to green path, and a green to black path. Awesome. You were able to connect all terminals by just performing random walks. But there is an annoyance. The annoyance is that you wanted these paths. There was some talk of vertex disjointness in the definition of graph miners, right? But uh, these walks, they're going to collide heavily. The white walks, for example, they will collide heavily near the white vertex. So for example, if it's a three regular graph, you're doing root and walks, at least root and over three of those walks will uh, use the same white neighbor of the initial white vertex. So these walks, they collide heavily. But uh, remember, like in the definition of graph miners, you were allowed to like uh, connect a bunch of islands. So for example, you can contract these uh, intersecting walks nearby the white vertex, you can contract them away safely. And uh, you will have this white island that you can connect with the green island. And uh, you can safely connect with the black island. And also you can safely connect the green and black islands. So in expanders, you can show that all of this can be done safely because expanders are just so well connected that, uh, I mean, this can be shown in a wide variety of ways. Turns out that uh, this does not generalize so well if you were to carry this process out for like general graphs. So like what I'm telling you essentially is the following that in expander graphs, the goldreich cron brushian checks out for the minor freeness question, but it does not quite check out for arbitrary graphs. It's like uh, the problem is kind of complicated. The intersection problem strikes back. Okay, and I'll tell you why it strikes back in more detail soon. And uh, the punchline is that their analysis does not quite, uh, the goldreich ron analysis for uh, some applications that they covered does not generalize well for our application. And like we were stuck here for a while. Yes. Uh, so I didn't quite follow how does this uh, expander random walk allows you to find a K minor. I did not tell you. I did not tell you. Uh, I, I only told you that it allows, allows you to connect all the terminals. Uh -huh. Then I said that uh, like once these terminals are connected, uh, you will have intersecting walks, but those intersections can be dealt with by contracting uh, away those intersections. Essentially, your intersections are benign okay. and you can contract the intersections away. I did not tell you how to do that. I just told you that it's not too difficult to do that. But once you do that, how do you find a K3 minor? Or if it oh, right, uh, because uh, what you will have is uh, like, uh, so in this picture already, I mean, this picture kind of just illustrates this. That's not the best illustration. So you have the white island and you have vertex disjoint white green path running between the white and green island. Okay. You have vertex disjoint uh, like black green path running between the black and green island. Uh -huh. and similarly, you have a vertex disjoint uh, like uh, white black path uh, over here running between the black and the white island. Okay. So essentially you like contract all these things. You just contract all of these, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, but I agree with you. I did not show you a proof. Okay, I just showed, uh, I just argued that this can be done or hand waved that this can be done. Okay, okay so for arbitrary, uh, yes. Uh, so I have a, a rather stupid question. So, uh, I mean, is it possible for an expander graph to be planar? I mean, no, not at all. That's a great oh, question. Okay. That's okay. a great question. An expander graph contains minors of all sizes, okay, up to square root n. It contains complete graph is minors of all sizes up to root n, okay. So that's a great question. And uh, like this was answered uh, recently by a work of Julia Shusha and Rachet Nemavut. And they argued that, uh, they showed that this uh, results of a similar flavor were present already in some previous works by uh, Michael Krivelevich and his co-authors. Okay. 
so now uh, like what i want to tell you is uh, like i want to tell you that in uh, arbitrary graphs the analysis suggested by goldrack and ron the recipe suggested by goldrack and ron does not uh, like work as well okay and uh, like we were stuck here for a while we were stuck here for like 2 years and uh, what we finally realized is that what you can do is that you can discover an even more general recipe and even more useful recipe than the recipe formulated by goldrack and ron the key is to just generalize their expander analysis and then do a general decomposition so i'll tell you more about this soon but uh, let's first recap the problem and make sure we understand uh, like where the analysis where copy pasting goldrack ron analysis got stuck okay so here is a brief recap so as we discovered that it is indeed easy to find a minor inside an expander and then i just uh, like told you that it does not work well for general graphs what's the reason for that so here is the reason the following plan so here is one natural plan that you will use and i'm trying to argue that this plan will fail so the plan is the following that maybe you can if you're given a graph that is epsilon far from being minor free what you can do is that you can partition this graph into several expanding pieces and you might expect that hey a lot of these pieces will end up uh, being epsilon far will inherit the fairness okay so perhaps you have a decomposition like this and if you could pretend that these pieces are sufficiently isolated you will just win but here is where troubles begin that uh, like if uh, you pick a random vertex let's say it comes from this piece and uh, you perform random walks uh, of some logarithmic length or something from this start vertex what will happen is that a random walks will be vertically they will leave their home copy they will just get out of this piece because this piece cannot have very large expansion the off the shelf expander decomposition tools do not guarantee good internal expansion that the internal expansion of this piece does not have to be very large in fact it is comparable to the external expansion so that's pretty bad the random walks of logarithmic length will just leave the piece and will never come back okay they will behave erratically so in particular uh, like uh, random walks leak out and if you use any of the of the self decompositions so any of the self decomposition that cuts epsilon dn edges the best internal expansion it can guarantee is merely one over polylog so that's why you lose that's why these standard approaches they do not work okay because the internal expansion is just bad okay so like uh, now what we do is that we generalize expander analysis so what does that mean so remember like in expanders what happens is that random walks of log of logarithmic length they mix well from every single source right and the bertie paradox argument it just exploits that random walks mix well from every single source and therefore uh, you can do this collision counting and what not to find minors but you do not need random walks to mix well from every single source even if they mix well from a mere handful n to the 0.99 vertices the bertie paradox analysis goes through the collision counting approach just works even if random walks mix rapidly from merely n to the 0.99 sources okay what we do is that we call such graphs where random walks mix well from uh, n to 0.99 vertices we call such graphs generalized expanders or fake expanders okay and now what we do is that we just decompose our graph into fake expanders okay and uh, like we show that this works of course uh, you cannot like compute this decomposition sublinear time so you have to like uh, uh, we simulate access to the pieces of this uh, generalized expander decomposition this fake expander decomposition and like we showed that this can be done okay so uh, like now let me just give you a taste of our algorithm it's not like uh, an actual algorithm it's just a caricature but in order to present that caricature i first need to like set up some notation i need to tell you a little bit about random walks so a random walk I, as we already know it's the process where like you just uh, like go to a random neighbor of the uh, source and you just keep on doing that just go to a random neighbor okay so i want to like make an important definition so like take some vertex v and uh, consider l length walks from this vertex think of the walk length as being n to the delta n to the 0.01 okay and now i make the following definition i call your vertex leaky if the walk from this vertex spreads well if the two norm of this distribution pvl is sufficiently small is smaller than l to the minus 10 i say that this vertex is leaky okay so the intuition is the following that uh, like uh, the intuition behind this definition is the following that uh, like if the uh, walk spreads well then uh, like l length walks if you perform many of them they will discover many different destinations they will end at a whole bunch of places okay so in particular l length walks will see up to poly l vertices like l to the 10 vertices okay and remember that in expander graphs every single vertex is leaky 
right? It expands every single vertex is leaky, and uh, like uh, so, the intuition is that uh, like in expanded, since every single vertex is leaky, like uh, the Berthe paradox argument goes through. If in whatever graph I am given, I see many leaky vertices, like n over l leaky vertices, n to the zero point ninety nine leaky vertices, the Berthe paradox analysis will again go through, and it will again be able to find a minor for me. Okay. So now having uh, like set up this notation, I can finally tell you what uh, our algorithm is uh, in terms of a cartoon picture. So here is what our algorithm looks like. But I should first pause and uh, like check if there are any questions. So these fake, I mean, like I don't know if you'll do this later on, but these fake expanders that you that that that, that you stated, is there a graph theoretic definition for them as well? I mean, like you did for expanders. I mean, the definition is like essentially what I just told you that uh, random walks mix rapidly from n to zero point ninety nine sources. Right, but is there a way of 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 looking at the graph and saying that this is a? Um, Can you say something about the stationary distribution of these graphs? Uh, Uh, I mean, uh, like the uh, graph is deregular anyway. I assumed that the graph is deregular, so the stationary distribution is uh, like one over n. It's the uniform distribution. Uh huh. Okay. And the convergence so, rate. Uh, yeah. So the convergence rate. I mean, like uh, there can be like sparse cuts, which can be like uh, which can block uh, like how fast the random walks mix. But uh, you can say something uh, which will be rather crude. but uh, like that's not the focus uh, for me right now uh, so you can definitely say something and uh, uh, the bound that you will get the naive bound that you will get will be convex crude for example it has got connections with stuff like the threshold rank discovered by aurora barak and storer and you can bound threshold rank which in turn implies a bound on the mixing time hmm. okay but uh, like uh, let me not go there so far I, uh, let me not go there right now Uh, right. Is there a, like a sort of canonical toy example of such a graph? I mean, what would oh, yeah, a good think, example uh, for this be? So, like for example, uh, right. Uh, so you mean like uh, this fake expander? What could be a good example? Yeah, yeah. Some it? like for example, would a dumbbell graph satisfy? Uh, Not something quite. That you... Not quite. Yeah. So, uh, right. I mean, what can be so? Uh, maybe like i will have an answer for you in the appendix so let's uh, defer that question for now okay sure. sounds good let's defer that question for now so now i want to present a cartoon picture of our algorithm so here is what our algorithm looks like in a cartoon picture so our algorithm has two different phases i do not know a priori whether uh, my graph has like many leaky vertices or very few leaky vertices so the first phase deals with the, the situation where you have, where you have very few leaky vertices so you pick some initial vertex and you perform five different random walks of logarithmic length or length and to the delta these walks take you to five different destinations v1 through v5 i am trying to find a k5 minor i should emphasize okay and uh, what you do is that you uh, discover locally some uh, so this is the non leaky this is a case where you have very few leaky vertices so uh, with high probability v1 through v5 all of them are non leaky vertices So you just explore some tiny little balls around v1 through v5. Random walks from v1 through v5, they will not diffuse very well. They will be contained inside some tiny neighborhood of v1 through v5, some tiny uh, little radius around v1 through v5. And you just see if these tiny little pieces around these destinations they contain a minor. If they contain a minor, you just reject the graph. Okay. Otherwise, uh, you uh, if this phase does not find a minor, uh, for all you know, your graph could have been a leaky graph where you could have many leaky vertices. So you enter the leaky phase. in the leaky phase what you do is this essentially you just uh, like try to do the berthe paradox analysis you just try to connect the terminals v1 through v5 by performing random walks and you see if a minor is found this way okay so i call the first phase the local search phase and the second phase is uh, we call it the find path phase and it can find k5 minors hiding inside expanders and variants of these ideas were already present in works by cladman and rubenfeld dating back to 1996 okay so essentially like this is the algorithm that we use uh, and uh, there are some more bells and whistles that we need to add that i will not describe and uh, like essentially like this allows you to find minors okay so now i want to tell you a little bit more about the two sided variant you might be wondering that hey like what about the two sided question now so your gut feel is that hey the one sided uh, 
algorithm already gives me a two sided algorithm right it's only a matter of uh, managing query complexity i sense that there was a question was there a question i don't believe so okay 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 so uh, i want to tell you that like at least syntactically it seems that the one sided variant should imply a two sided uh, algorithm as well it's just a question about managing the query bound so let's see like what can we do so what we discovered is that uh, if your graph had uh, like uh, many leaky vertices it could not it could not conceivably be planar let's take the contrapositive if the graph is planar it cannot have too many leaky vertices it has at most n over l leaky vertices okay so let's just uh, like uh, note this down prominently so now what we can do is that uh, like we can immediately design a tester now right so the tester is kind of apparent that uh, the non leaky phase remains as it was in the leaky phase you no longer need to do this birder paradox business what you can do is that you can just estimate the number of leaky vertices right just estimate the number of leaky vertices you are done right but there is a snag there is a snag with this plan what's the snag it's the following we were able to show that there are many leaky vertices only when the walk length was into the delta the walk length dependent on n and we are allowed a query bound of uh, only polynomial n over epsilon so we need to perform very short walks and we need to show that uh, like you have few leaky vertices right so turns out that you can do this but in order to do this you need to exploit some deeper planar properties so there are some deeper planar properties that i will describe in the second part of the talk uh, that i'll do just now and uh, you can use uh, these deeper planar, planar properties to show the following that uh, indeed uh, like you can break your graph into very tiny pieces pieces of size merely one over epsilon square by losing very few edges by losing a mere epsilon fraction of edges running between these pieces and uh, essentially now what you can show is that uh, like size of every single piece is small it's one over epsilon squared therefore uh, like for most vertices what will happen is that the random walks that originate inside some vertex let's say vertex falling inside this piece some random vertex that comes from this piece those random walks will almost never really leave this piece okay so their to norm uh, will remain large their to norm is at least like uh, two num squared is at least epsilon squared okay so that uh, like lets you deal with this problem and uh, like essentially that allows you to show that there are indeed very few leaky vertices even when the walk length is mere some polynomial in one over epsilon okay, and that uh, like lets you finish this problem by the test that we just described where you just estimate the number of leaky vertices any questions about this part so far what are these deeper deeper planar properties like yeah let uh, me describe that now let me describe that something there or yeah uh, it's just hyperfinite test but uh, let me tell you more about this uh, this will show up right now in the second part so in the second part i want to tell you about efficient partition oracles and uh, like uh, let's see what these deeper planar properties are okay so in planar graphs for planar graphs we know a very nice theorem this holds for all planar graphs regardless of the degree bound does not matter whether planar graphs are small degree or not so i give you a planar graph you can find for me cleverly some root n vertices such that if you have to throw these root n vertices away all the connected components of your graph their size becomes at most 2n over 3 okay so you can cleverly select root n vertices after deleting which all connected components are super small their size is at most 2n over 3 okay this uh, thing is called the balanced separator theorem and it facilitates lots of divide and conquer algorithms on planar graphs like it's uh, your go to weapon to attack algorithmic questions on planar graphs So let's think about bounded degree graphs for now. So number of vertices, number of edges, same thing. You delete uh, root n edges, and uh, you can break your graph into a number of pieces whose size is at most two n over three. Keep applying this planar separator theorem recursively. Okay. So a recursive application of the planar separator theorem will give you the following: that you can obtain pieces whose size is merely one over epsilon square. The pieces are small in size, and the number of edges that run between these pieces is merely an epsilon fraction. such a decomposition is called a hyperfinite decomposition okay where the p size is k 1 over epsilon square so the parameter k is 1 over epsilon square and the number of edges running between the pieces is merely an epsilon fraction so it's called epsilon k hyperfinite decomposition in particular for planar graphs you get epsilon comma 1 over epsilon square hyperfinite decompositions okay so that's a hyperfinite decomposition which can be simply obtained by recursively using the planar separator theorem Okay, and uh, like uh, these decompositions, they are they enable lots of approximation algorithms for a wide variety of computational tasks okay, for various graph parameters. 
So now I want to introduce uh, the question that uh, we are interested in exploring in this second part of the talk. And this question is the following. I want you to build for me a primitive. What this primitive should do is that it should take as input this vertex V, the vertex V over here. And uh, uh, like uh, there is some hyperfinite decomposition. There are possibly many. The hyperfinite decomposition does not have to be unique. So this primitive should implicitly fix some hyperfinite decomposition P ahead of time. And what it should do is that it should find for me, this primitive should find for me, the hyperfinite piece containing this vertex V. Should, should find this red piece for me, okay? And uh, the time taken to find this red piece should be only polynomial and one or epsilon, okay? And this should happen for like all the pieces. This hyperfinite decomposition needs to be fixed implicitly ahead of time, okay? And uh, of course, you have got to be consistent across all vertices. It should not cheat. So I should not answer hyperfinite piece for V with respect to some hyperfinite decomposition P. And I answer uh, like the hyperfinite piece containing vertex U with respect to some different hyperfinite decomposition P prime. I should not be doing stupid things. Okay, I have to be consistent across all vertices. So Hasidim, Kellner, Newend, and Onak built such a primitive in 2010 and Levy and Ron, they refined their techniques to like uh, give a faster implementation for such a primitive. And they use this primitive in particular to develop two-sided testers for planarity. So in joint work with uh, Shishar and Stuhlman and uh, like uh, uh, Fox last year, we give implementations for partition oracles, which are in time polynomial and over epsilon. And uh, we used uh, this result uh, as an additional bonus to like uh, develop a tester for all planar properties. So this property is like planarity, planarity intersection something, like planar and triangle freeness. Okay, so we developed testers for all planar properties, every single planar property out there, whose query bound is merely exponential over epsilon square. What I find remarkable is that uh, like this tester is just a black box tester for all properties, including the undecidable ones. Okay, all planar properties. Okay, I should emphasize planar is important for me. Okay, so this concludes the second part of the talk. Uh, I did not uh, like uh, give you any like proof ideas or proof architecture over here. But are what there is, any questions? Undecidable. I mean, it's a finite graph, right? So how is there an undecidable? Yeah, property? I mean, but there are undecidable properties. For example, uh, like you might ask uh, a question about the like homomorphism densities that. Uh, like uh, uh, you can give me a certain uh -huh. polynomial and you can ask, does this polynomial evaluate to a certain number where the polynomial is uh, evaluated in homomorphism densities of uh, like some interesting subgraphs, right? So the homomorphism density of the, so the, of the input, so the graph is the input and you're looking at sort of what? So, so in very large graphs. Very large graphs, yes. How many, so, so but they are not part of the input. That's the thing where yes. undecidability comes in. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely, right? So, so uh, okay. All this is for uh, D regular graphs or bounded degree graphs. All this is for bounded degree graphs, right? We just deregularize it for convenience. Okay. All right. So, like uh, with this out of the way, now I'd like to tell you a little bit about my teaching plans. Uh, oh, b before that, I'm sorry. <laughs> I should tell you a little bit about uh, my long-term goals. So, my long-term goals are uh, like the following. So. As I go down this Gosh, uh, just before we go, I just want a quick question. So roughly intuitively what you're say, saying to us is that for these two sided tests, if there are mm -hmm. too few leaky uh, nodes, then you're likely to have a planar graph. And if you have many leaky nodes, then you're likely to have a, uh, these crossings and all of that. Minor. The other way around. If you have many leaky vertices, yeah. your graph is kind of expandary. So it's mm -hmm. definitely not planar. That's if you right. have many leaky vertices, the graph is not planar. If you have uh, like very few leaky vertices, your graph stands a chance of being planar. That's right. But uh, if there are very few, very few leaky vertices, you can kind of locally partition the graph into very tiny pieces. And uh, I can just uh, like give you query access to these pieces. So you can name a random piece and I can sort of give you access to that piece. And you can like just check a constant number of these pieces and uh, check whether they are planar or not planar. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, right. So now I can like describe my long-term goals. So my long-term goals, uh, like as I go down this slide, the problems will become fuzzier and fuzzier. So as a first concrete open problem, we have the following that uh, like, uh, can you develop for me an algorithm that finds root and sized balanced separators in nearly linear time in graph data H minor free? 
So for example, for planar graphs, this is already known. You can find root and sized balance separators for me in linear time for planar graphs. But uh, like imagine uh, like graphs that uh, do not have any clique minus of size 10, right? Uh, so these graphs, they also like contain uh, root and size balance separators, but all the algorithms that know so far, they either lose on the separator size bound or they lose on the running time bound. It looks conceivable to me that our techniques can uh, like overcome this limitation because uh, like in some sense, we imagine that uh, we have this partition oracle that uh, like gives you access to these pieces and you can kind of agglomerate these pieces. You can combine these pieces. So it's like uh, this algorithm that combines things rather than the algorithms that break things. The standard algorithms, they kind of, kind of try to break things. So maybe there is hope, we do not know. Then uh, there is uh, like this conjecture that uh, like uh, I'm told a favorite conjecture of uh, Anupam Gupta, the so-called layer embedding conjecture. I know very little about these problems. So this problem essentially like tells you the following that uh, like in uh, player, the shortest part metric on planar graphs embeds in L1 with constant distortion. That's the conjecture. My interest in this problem really comes from uh, the planar partitioning side that can I improve uh, algorithms or planar sparse cut? Can I find planar, uh, give uh, a constant factor approximation to sparse cut in planar graphs? So like again, uh, like our techniques seem to be able to say something. They are connected with threshold rank in some crude ways. So it's not clear if uh, like our techniques uh, will say something uh, like really useful here. And uh, like now I'll present some problems that are kind of more fuzzier. So like this is a big open question that, uh, so Kawarebeshi, Kobayashi and Reed back in 2011 announced a linear time algorithm for funding forbidden minors. However, their algorithm had a bug. And uh, when they fixed that bug, they ended up with a quadratic time algorithm. So it's uh, kind of uh, curious to see if uh, even sub-quadratic sub time algorithms are possible. Then uh, like uh, I'm interested in understanding the next frontier in property testing problems. So uh, our uh, results imply property tests for a wide variety. Yes, sorry. Was there a question? No, sorry, that was just a... Right. So uh, we are interested in understanding whether you, uh, you can push the uh, class of properties that you can test for bounded degree graphs and like one very rich class that is kind of uh, close to the class that we know how to test is this so-called bounded expansion graph classes. Not definite for now. Uh, like and uh, like as a rather intriguing open question, I'm interested in understanding whether you could have a spectral proof of the robertson Seymour theorem. I mean, like here I am like talking about things that I don't really understand uh, well at all. So, but uh, like there is uh, stuff like Weil's law. So there is this uh, phenomenon called Weil's law. So it tells you the following that if, if I give you a Ramanian manifold and the Laplacian of this Ramanian manifold gamma, and they tell you that, uh, uh, hey, this Laplacian, it's eigenvalues, they grow very slowly. Then somehow the growth rate of the eigenvalues of the Laplacian of gamma reveals the intrinsic dimensionality of gamma. And turns out that uh, there are results by uh, 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 James Lee, Eric Price uh, and uh, then Shangua Teng and uh, somebody else, uh, which kind of tell you that a Weil's law like phenomenon continues to hold for bounded degree planar graphs. So maybe like, uh, is there a hope in which, uh, uh, in some sense, uh, using which you can uh, like recover a spectral proof of robertson seymour theorem, even for bounded degree graphs. So that's something I'm like rather, uh, like at this stage, I cannot say anything about, but I find this direction exciting. And in terms of short term goals, like uh, here are some problems, like some three problems that I think are immediately attackable using our problems. They're setting ducks for our techniques. So for example, uh, like here is a question that can you test planar Hamiltonicity, planarity intersection Hamiltonicity in time polynomial in one epsilon. And uh, like, uh, can you characterize? So we characterized, uh, we showed that all planar properties can be tested with a number of queries that is exponential in one or epsilon. You might be interested in understanding uh, those properties that can be tested efficiently with a query bound of polynomial in one or epsilon. So can you characterize such properties? I think that this is doable by combining some techniques from distribution testing and uh, using some of what we have. Problem three is an immediate setting duck for our techniques. Problem three essentially asks that, hey, we had this partition oracle primitive and uh, it kind of asks for some kind of randomness reduction in this primitive. And it looks like uh, Nissan Wegderson plus our Fox 21 paper but uh, like uh, uh, I need to like verify, but it looks that's pretty much all there is to it. Then there are some more short term problems that uh, can you generalize minor fitness testing to downbounded degree setting? 
I think that this is kind of remar- a very interesting direction because uh, property testers, very few property testers are known and done about the degree regime. And uh, like kn- knife techniques to like reduce degrees, they just don't uh, go through. And uh, interestingly enough, it seems that uh, this problem four, this short term uh, problem four, we need to resolve it before we are able to attack problem one in the long term slide. Right? Because uh, like uh, somehow if you want to like uh, get uh, efficient algorithms or planar separators by this agglomeration approach, this agglomeration approach will necessarily produce vertices of high degree. So like this seems to be like uh, uh, the problem for appears to be like, can you cut it? Like the first uh, door that you have to enter through in order to add problem one on the long-term slide. There are a couple more uh, that I'll not describe. Now, uh, finally, like I would like to like uh, describe a uh, few courses that I'd like to teach if uh, like I'm offered. So there are like some courses that I saw on like the IFR website that I think I can teach like a breadth of algorithms courses and uh, like toolkit courses and automata computability courses. Then there are some courses that maybe they are offered at TIFR, I just do not know. So like courses, approximation algorithms, randomized algorithms, and like some topics courses that I would love to teach. So the topics courses that I'd love to teach and uh, uh, which I think, I hope that I do not need to prepare more for are spectral graph theory, probabilistic method and uh, property testing courses. I think that I can teach them without much effort. Other topics that I am interested in teaching uh, that I'm really enthusiastic about, but this will require effort and preparation on my side are PCPs and randomness approximation, Boolean function analysis and sum of squares approach for optimization. So I think that concludes my talk. Uh, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Hey, thanks Akash. Um... Yeah, I can see some virtual as well as physical hands being clapped. <laughs> yeah, so two questions uh, for Akash. So, uh, so I was just wondering. So, does this would your algorithm or the the general technique extend for, uh, let's say, graphs of bounded genus and stuff like that? I mean, or is that? Yeah, what yeah, you yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. So, our techniques work for all minor free graph classes. I just presented it for planarity for concreteness. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. It works for all minor free graph classes. And what are the H minors? Sorry? So you mentioned H minor free. What, what, what H minor. So H is some graph. Let's say click on the right. Okay. It's just okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so, so I can with the undecidability thing. So uh, doesn't your algorithm then say that it's decidable? I mean, why can't you just- Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, and... That's curious, yeah. So how do we, what are we doing here? So clearly we are cheating. How do we cheat? So in time exponential in order epsilon square, I write down a bunch of properties about the graph that I'm given. Now what I do is that I'm only interested in the query bound, okay? So I look at uh, the collection of all n vertex degree at most d graphs. I write down the numbers for those graphs. If the numbers look similar, I say that, uh, you know what, this graph probably has the property, it's close to having the property. So I enumerate over all in vertex degree D graphs. That enumeration step is where the cheat lies. No, but enumeration is still, I mean, still a fine I yeah, yeah. process. So what's... Right, but we are only interested in the query bound, right? So what you do is that, uh, like, uh, so, so this it, why doesn't this just give an algorithm, like an effective, effective algorithm, not necessarily efficient, but certainly, so, uh, I mean, uh, the property is undecidable. I did not give you any running time bounds, right? I just give you a bound on uh, like the number of queries that you need. So, uh, I, I, I'm i not sure. If you just, uh, you're, so, whatever uh, running time you are doing is like enumerating all graphs of size fixed, right? Uh, enumerating all, uh, like, uh, uh, right. So, what is the question I'm answering? So, the question I'm answering is the following, that uh, like given some, let's say, undecidable property, Mm -hmm. and a graph that is given to you. Mm -hmm. The question that I'm answering is that uh, like, uh, does this graph uh, like have the property or is it epsilon far from that property? Right? Yes, but uh, but you... uh, So this epsilon farness is not actually uh, to show it for all graphs. You will just check that there are enough graphs. Okay. So some graphs you are just, you don't care in some sense. Yes, yes, yes. That's what saves me. Yes, you're right. So the undecidability is because uh, for, for exactly those graphs which lie in that uh, white region, right? Perhaps, I mean, perhaps. But you, I, you I, I think you're right. Again, uh, yeah. 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 So uh, I, I use the white region to kind of uh, like save myself. Yes. Yes. 
Yes. In terms of the random box, so in the small small subgraph expander kind of setting that you mentioned, I think uh, this is the notion of evolving set random walk, which is I think which is which detects the so oh, yeah. it detects, detects the local expansion better than the usual random walk. So does that help here, or uh, or is that? Uh, could you repeat the question? Evolving sets is a process that like uh, has annoyed me enough. But uh, could you repeat the question one, once more, please? Yeah. So so, so yeah. So, so so it's it's sort of in some sense better than detecting this kind of like a local, local uh, sort of bottleneck, right? Uh, yes. Yes. Than the usual random walk. So. Yes. So uh, does that help in this kind of thing, or? No, so we no. do not use evolving sets. We use the lower Shumnovitz technique and uh, like. Uh, I understand the evolving sets paper at a like syntactic level. I can like just uh, verify the proof line by line, and uh, mm -hmm. at the end I'm like, God, what happened? But uh, uh, lower Shumnovitz technique uh, like kind of offers similar guarantees, and you can so use what is lower. The is there is more uh, optimization based? Or... Yeah, so lower Shumnovitz technique is a random walk based technique. So the idea mm -hmm. that lower Shumnovitz had was the following: that in order to understand the rate of convergence of random walks, what they did was that uh, like uh, they looked at an entire curve. So like, uh, what is this curve? So I may talk on lower Shumnovitz, uh, like that's available on my web page. Mm -hmm. uh, like that was uh, for a course that Anand and uh, Ankit Garg taught. Mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, and in particular, uh, so you have an entire curve and uh, like, uh, let me tell you what this curve is. So this curve is a, I call it the greedy aggregation curve. So this curve greedily does the following thing. Uh, like uh, you look at the current distribution on the vertices mm -hmm. and uh, so, Imagine that it's a deregular graph. You can like as well uh, think about a distribution that it induces on the edges. So you duplicate edges in both directions mm -hmm. and you look at the distribution it induces on uh, like the edges in like this direction. So mm -hmm. if I am a vertex, my name is V and uh, like I have D neighbors incident on me. Then I look at the D neighbors that leave me and mm -hmm. I put on all of those neighbors, a probability mass P of V divided by the degree D. Mm -hmm. Right Now what I do is that I look at uh, the heaviest edges under this distribution over the edges and uh, I like uh, uh, plot a curve uh, whose uh, uh, range is the integer points between zero to M, the number of edges mm -hmm. after duplication. And now what I do is that uh, like uh, I write down the prefix sums of uh, these probabilities. So for example, at point number K, when I consider the first K edges, I write down some of the K heaviest edges at that point. I plot the K heaviest edges above K. I point the K plus one heaviest edges above K plus one and so on. I look at this curve. Mm -hmm. So this curve considers prefix sum of a decreasing list, right? Mm -hmm. You're considering vertices in decreasing order uh, or edges in decreasing order. The idea is that this curve is concave and lower shams which are able to show that this curve, like as your distribution progresses towards uniformity, this curve collapses to a straight line mm -hmm. with slope uh, like uh, one over two M, one over the number of edges. Mm -hmm. Okay. And to look at the rate of convergence of this curve. Mm -hmm. So the convergence of this curve, uh, like, uh, uh, tells you if there are low conductance cuts. If this curve does not collapse, you have seen a low conductance cut. Mm -hmm. And that technique, uh, like, uh, what I'm told is that the uh, lower Shumnovitz technique is already like good enough to like recover guarantees close to evolving sets. Though, like, please don't quote me on this. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I understand the lower Shumnovitz technique much better than the evolving sets technique. But uh, I'm not sure if uh, uh, I think that the evolving sets technique could also have been used. To mm -hmm. like find low conductance cuts in our paper, but uh, using uh, the lower Sumnovitz uh, calculations was much more transparent for us. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, I hmm? guess maybe that's it. Um, are there any more questions? Okay, in that case, uh, let, let's close the session and Akash, I'll see you in maybe 10 minutes. Uh, I'll, I'll just get a copy or something and I'll see you on the okay, other. Okay, okay. Yes, please. I'll see you in 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay, okay.